and welcome back to how to connect with humans uh this is series three episode two, two. how are you Wayne? good how are you we're okay yeah good thank lovely you. to have you here you do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so oh our guest our guest our guest this evening oh, such an incredible loving warm caring individual what can we say about Carol? It's Carol, it's Carol Burroughs. And Carol mm -hmm. Burroughs um, is how it all started for us. Uh, we mentioned it last week as well. Um, we did our first training uh, at the Insight Space, um, which uh, Carol Burroughs and Ian Watson ran together, um, which uh, so Ian was with us last week. And uh, it's so beautiful to start this uh, series with uh, with people that have heard this understanding for the first time. Yeah. And um, we were saying to Carol that, um, particularly because I, I did the training a bit before Wayne did it, I used to look at Ian and Carol talking at the front of a room and it was such a beautiful feeling. And it was something like this. It was just sort of like a... Um, it was it was a safe space. It was a, a place where we all sat around and we talk about um, this understanding and they have this beautiful presence together. And I used to think, I want to do that. I want to do that. And seven years later, we're pinching ourselves <laughs> of trying to understand how come that we are both together uh, running the series and we can have this beautiful gift of having Carol with us. Carol, good evening. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much. That's a, such a beautiful introduction. It's really um, quite special to be here. Um, you know, having met you when you were just starting out on your, your journey into this beautiful understanding and to now see this absolutely incredible series or three series now that, that you've that you've created is really beautiful. And um, so thank you for inviting me and thank you to everyone who's on the call for being here. Um, when you um, first invited me and said, well, what did I want to talk about? The thing that came to mind was love. And it was you guys that inspired that thought because when I look at you and I see the love that you have for each other. And I see how that really, really shines out of you. And that's very inspiring. Um, and it's very special. And I think that even the creation of this series and how you've so freely given your time and invited all these wonderful speakers, that's an act of love as well, isn't it? And, and I think what you've created is very, very, very lovely. So, yeah, what can I say? I, I I think I called it the barriers of love, didn't I? Because yeah, you, you uh, discovering, discovering the barriers, the barriers to, love. to love. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when I started think to think about that, what came to mind was this quotation um, that you see everywhere, actually, and it's most frequently attributed to Rumi, the poet, the thirteenth century mystic and poet and the quote is this your task is not to seek for love but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you've built against it and that speaks to me very deeply if you Google that quote, you'll find it everywhere. You'll find it on t-shirts, you'll find it on mugs. <laughs> so it obviously speaks to a lot of people and people have written all sorts of things in popular psychology and what have you about finding these barriers to love. And we get entreated to uncover all the things that we do to stop ourselves feeling love. And often that means delving back into our past and finding, finding out what it was that happened to us that prevents us from feeling love and the things that we might have been hurt by when we were younger. But actually there's a much deeper meaning than that. 
And I think this understanding of the three principles helps us to uncover that and find out what's really going on. And it's pointing us in a very different direction. It's pointing us to understand that actually love is our true nature, that it's within us all. And one of the most powerful things about the three principles understanding is it helps us to see that the only thing that creates a barrier between us and any other person, between us and our understanding of our true nature, of actually being connected with that, is the power of thought. So we don't need to go looking for all those individual barriers, the, the thought content that we perpetually create. All we have to do is realize something about the nature, our own true nature as literally being love and seeing that it's only ever the power of thought that separates us from another human being. And as we start to realize thought and see its role in creating this separation between us, we start to see the barriers, our own personal barriers that we've created. And we start to appreciate that when we settle down into a quiet mind, we experience more love. So Carolina, we met maybe seven, eight years ago yes. now. And um, we were talking just before this, the, the call started about your response when you first met me. <laughs> and it's a really beautiful example of what I'm just pointing to, that actually it's, our thought can get in a way of seeing somebody for who they really are and experiencing the love that's already within ourselves. So do you want to say something about that, Carolina? What your, <laughs> yeah. your, your experience? Uh, I think, I think uh, also because when I, when I, um... I, I wrote a testimonial for your website, I think, and, and then um, I thought, well, I would, re I would really like to be honest about how I feel with about Carol because how my perception change. Um, and I signed up for the uh, practitioner's training um, with Ian Watson, as far as I knew. And then I turn up on the first day and there, there is Ian, and then on that table next to him, or or wherever it was, it was Carol, and um, and they were introducing themselves, and we we're going to run the, the course, and I, and I got like, I got really cross because I thought nobody told me about this. This was a course with Ian Watson. What is she doing here? And um, you know, have a bit of a, you know, this is not what I expected, and. Uh, and, uh, and and probably it was like, you know, just like engaging horns and of, of, of ego and, and who is she and I don't know her. And um, and uh, obviously that uh, that change, you know, because <laughs> um, once once Carol um, starts talking and you give yourself the opportunity of uh, of seeing Carol without any of your thinking I think that's what we're pointing at my, my preconceptions and um, what I felt at that point then I gave myself the opportunity of uh, of seeing you yeah um, that's it and that's such a beautiful example of how this is always in play that actually the only thing that ever becomes a barrier to us feeling love is thought in the moment, our judgments, our preconceptions, our ideas about people. And the deeper we see the nature of that, the, the, the role of thought in that, there's something incredible helpful about that understanding in that relationship with other people because If we are truly only ever experiencing that thought in the moment, 
we don't need to really work on the content or know what the content is or do anything with that. But we can know that the potential exists for that thought to change. Thoughts always changing, constantly. It's never fixed. So whatever we're feeling about any given person, if it's not love, we can know for sure that we just have some ideas about them that almost certainly aren't true. And the more we allow ourselves to be open to that idea that the potential for us to feel love for anybody is there, the more we get to experience that. Because truly when we feel love, we're feeling our own true nature. The feeling of love is a remembrance of who we are. It's an act of recognition. Sydney Banks points over and over again to our true nature literally being love. He says, divine mind is pure love. Divine consciousness is pure love. Divine thought is pure love. That's literally our true nature. And when we're feeling love, it's always coming from within. That's what the Rumi quote is pointing us to. It's what Sydney Banks points us to, that it's literally who we are. And we're remembering that when we feel love. So the potential exists for us to experience that in any given moment with any person that's in front of us. And that's a beautiful thing to know. Now, it doesn't mean to say we're, all, we're always gonna feel that, we don't. Yeah. But the potential exists for that. And it's when we allow our judgments and our thinking to drop away that we get to experience it. And even with people that we've known for, for a very long time, you know, our loved ones, um, people in our family, our friends, there's always the potential for us to see something we haven't seen before. When we uncover those barriers, those, those thought barriers that we've created for them to drop away. And I know that the more deeply I've gone into the principles understanding, the more I've seen the role of thought, I've had this repeated experience over and over again of falling in love, falling in love with people, falling in love with the world, yeah, over and over again. I remember one of the very first times I experienced a spontaneous arising of this feeling was I was going to collect my daughter from school and there was this young child walking in front of me and I can still see her now she had these red ringlets and they were shining in the sun. And first of all, there was this recognition of something beautiful. And then it was this filling of my heart with love as though she was my own child. And that's a repeated experience. And it happens when we drop out of our thinking and we get quiet. That's something that's incredibly helpful in any relationship where we feel like we're up against something, where we're not in connection with someone, where we're not feeling um, in a good place in that relationship because we start to open our minds and our hearts to the possibility of something different. And even in a, in a relationship where you think you know somebody really well, there's always something fresh to see. And that starts by just as much as we can, letting go of all our preconceived ideas about that person and getting present with them and, and listening. 
not listening to our own thoughts about them, but truly listening and being present with that person. And we can find a level of connection that, that wasn't there previously. I had a beautiful example of that a few years ago with my own father. In my narrative about my dad, who I wasn't particularly close to, he was the logical, the engineer, non-spiritual person. My mom was the spiritual person. She was the one that I had uh, much more in common with. And my father phoned me one evening to tell me that my granddad had died and that he'd been with my granddad when he died. And as I started to listen to him, I saw the old narrative drop away and I just and I listened. And in that space of listening and presence, he described to me his experience of being with my granddad when he passed. And it was a really deeply spiritual experience that he had. And I just saw my dad in a completely different way than I had previously just through letting go of that, that old, old narrative I'd had about him not being a spiritual person and not understanding and not being interested in those things. And what comes into my mind as I'm saying that is Sidney Banks saying that there is no person who's more spiritual than another. We're all the same. And there's something so powerful about seeing the universal nature of that, that our own true nature is the same. Every person, however they manifest, however they show up to us, every single person shares that same true nature and, that, and, and a facet of that nature is, is pure love. And there's incredible potential in that. And it's one of the things that's so powerful about this understanding because it gives us a chance to, to settle down and have an experience of our true nature and we experience more love and the barriers fall down and the separation falls down and we experience a oneness and that and that's got so much hope in it not just for us as individuals but for the whole of humanity and so it's really beautiful carolina and wayne to see you creating this amazing platform and giving so freely and giving people an opportunity to, to, to share in this, in, in this lovely understanding. Yeah. So what about when we don't feel love? <laughs> when we have all these thoughts going on that um, get in the way of us experiencing that? Well, Sidney Banks talks a lot, doesn't he, about love and understanding. And even when we don't feel the love, we can still have the understanding. We can still see the, as what I was talking about just now, about the universality of it. And we can know that whatever somebody else is showing up as for us, they're also just caught in their thinking. Maybe it's thinking about us. Now, we might not be able to do anything about that, but we can understand it. And we can have compassion for that. Yeah. And sometimes if we're very lucky, that compassion will spontaneously arise. And sometimes with that comes forgiveness. Again, these, these, these facets of our true nature that are always there, but just temporarily obscured for us. Now, this Rumi quote, actually, it turns out when I started to look through my Rumi books, actually not to be by Rumi at all. <laughs> it's very often attributed to him. Um, but actually, it, you can actually find, I wanted to read it in context. I wanted to read the, the, the couplet in context to see what else I could learn, to see um, 
what else Rumi said about it, but actually it's in A Course of Miracles, um, which is a book that was um, uh, channeled by Helen Shookman, so it's her words. And when I rent, went to the book and again to read it in context, I found another beautiful quote which I'd just like to share with you, and it's this. The greatest miracle is simply gaining a full awareness of love's presence in one's life. That really spoke to me. And it's pointing in exactly the same way that Sidney Banks does, pointing us to love's constant presence in our life. It's always there, never not there. And all we have to do is remember that that is literally our true nature. Love is such a central theme in people's lives. And often it's at the, it's at the end of someone's life that that gets brought into full context. But we don't have to wait till the end. We can wake up and realize that now. One of the things that the internet and mobile phones and text messaging um, has provided us with is examples of what happens when somebody thinks they're going to die and um, one of my colleagues in the hospice where I volunteer has collected all these quotations of people uh, where they've um, uh, they've been on a plane that's about to crash or they've been in some other life-threatening situation and they've reached out thinking they're going to die and sometimes they have to their loved ones. And they say things like, the plane is going to crash and I just really want you to know that I absolutely love you. Tell the kids I love them. And often when people come to the ends of their lives, they want to find an expression of that love. I do volunteer work in a hospice and so often what becomes central to people is, is how they express their love and how they make meaning of their life through looking back at those experiences of love in their life. And that can take so many different forms. Um, one beautiful woman, uh, she was the mother of two children and her expression of love at the end of her life was to fill, to cook a month's worth of food and fill her freezer so that when she passed, her husband wouldn't have to think about feeding the children for a bit. Love is so central to human existence. And there's something so profound about understanding the principles and uncovering that for ourselves, uncovering our true nature. Sometimes I meet people in the course of my work who are alone. They don't have a spouse or children or, or very much family. Maybe they're entirely alone in the world. And yet what's profoundly beautiful is for them to uncover that actually love lies within. And love is essential. It's the essence of who we are. Sydney Banks talks about that in in Second Chance, well actually he talks about it in every single book he wrote. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just read to you from Second Chance what he says about love. He says, true love is pure spirit power. 
manifest. The manifestation can take many forms. There's a mother loving her child, a doctor caring for his patient, a father playing with his children, a child playing with a new puppy, people caring for the less fortunate. Love is a positive feeling and if people cultivate this feeling in their lives, they will surely free themselves from any unbalanced conditions that surround them. Love is not just an idea. Love is a living, breathing essence that the wise can pluck from the air at will and, must, and like a master artist, mould it into something beautiful. Love makes the impossible possible. Love is a word that we use to point to the essence of who we are. It's an act of remembrance. But there are other words that point to that too. And one of, one of the other acts of recognition is the recognition of beauty. So it's not just about love we feel for another person or an animal, but it's recognizing the beauty in the world. And when we get quiet and our thinking gets still for a moment, we see more beauty in the world. Literally, when we recognize beauty, it's a reflection of who we are within. The love is within, the beauty is within. Everyone on this call will have had some moment where they have seen something profoundly beautiful. And it brings with it this beautiful feeling that's very, very similar to a feeling of love. Maybe it's a beautiful sunset that you've seen. Something in nature, a newborn baby. There's um, a place near, near my home in Cornwall that people go to watch the sunset. And it's a very quiet, out of the way place. But in the summer it can get quite busy. And there's something that I've noticed as people gather in this place, sometimes in groups or families, they can be really busy. You know, they're chatting away, they're having a beautiful holiday, the children are playing, people are scrolling through their phones, maybe they're setting up their camera to capture the sunset. And there comes a moment, often just before the sun slips into the sea, where everyone gets quiet and still, and there's this shared recognition of beauty. And as I'm looking in that direction now, that true nature emerges and expresses itself as love as a feeling of love. And so often when I work with groups of people, I end up saying, I love you all. <laughs> and I mean it. <laughs> and um, yeah, I don't know what else to add to that. Carolina, if there's something that you'd like me uh, to share, or if anyone has any questions, or if anybody would like to share their own experience of um, experiencing and remembering their true nature and, and having that experience of love or recognizing beauty, that would be really lovely to hear that. 
That's so beautiful. Um, thank you. And as, as you're saying, you are talking about the stillness of the sunset and pointing towards there. And I was looking at the group on the on the on the grid, and you probably saw the same. Like I could, I know people are muted, but you you can feel that quietness. That if everybody was unmuted, we could probably hear this complete quiet. Um, that we we have experienced being live with people with with you and then we, we respect that because um we, we know that's where the the real um, juice is mm. yeah um so it would be lovely to hear um I think just before we do, I think yeah. for me, I love what you said about beauty. Because when we started the first lockdown in March, and I've said this a few times, I remember looking out of the living room window one morning and everything was just so still. It was just still beautiful and I just thought wow this is this is just beauty this is just the world kind of paused and even in that moment there's still beauty even in the midst of a pandemic and the amount of weather that we had, the amount of really nice weather we had at that point, for me, I believe it was because everyone just stopped and the world just decided, right, okay, because you've stopped, here's some love from me. <laughs> That's beautiful, Wayne. And, and maybe what it allowed you to do is for your your mind to settle down yeah. and your personal thinking to just stop just for a moment yeah. because whenever that happens we see beauty everywhere yeah. we can't not because it's literally who we are it's literally the essence of who we are let's see so if you want to ask a question or share something um, you can now unmute yourself or just uh, put your hand up in case you can't unmute yourself and you want to uh, Maggie is putting her hand up so you may have to unmute yourself Maggie because of uh, just because of the settings okay. you are. I think I've done that you've done it <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, yeah I would like to just share something, um, an experience yesterday. Um, I've been swimming in the sea all, well, since March last year. Um, and I know it's kind of flavour of the month at the moment, but it has been, for me, just uh, incredible. And yesterday, uh, it was a nice day. We're on a, um, a sort of estuary in South Devon where you've got a river, lovely um, wooded banks, but you're looking out to the open sea there was just my husband and I in the water, nobody else really around at all. I was comfortable in the water. You know, it was just absolutely incredible. And, you know, for that period of time, just everything fell away. There was just, you know, it was just purity, clarity, beauty. Um, it was just absolutely extraordinary in a you know, seemingly in some ways, perhaps an alien environment, but to feel completely comfortable in the water. It was just really, really lovely. That's beautiful, Maggie. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And and so often it comes upon us when we least expect it, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. 
Yeah, I, I love that you pointed out, you know, it's now maybe the flavor of the month. Like before, I probably, I, I knew a few people that were, uh, um, you know, in the UK, it's not that common to go and, well, at least for me, to go and swim in open waters, like in other places in the world, because it's cold and, and some places you need to know that it's safe. and. Um, but funny enough, when we were in lockdown, we were allowed to go out to, um, to exercise. And obviously for people that like swimming, all the swimming pools were closed. Mm -hmm. So any contact to being in water, um, started, people started becoming more curious about, you know, swimming in natural waters which i guess that's what as as you know primates as we started being you know like as this is part of the animal kingdom probably is what we naturally will do um so it was like a a natural call to go back to to nature and get curious about it and and i think that is beautiful that you pointed out that but um but yeah, it says that you get in that environment with your husband and it's just you and nature and unless you have thinking about being cold, I guess that's the sounds like <laughs> an ideal, ideal place to so thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah. It's there's something quite tempting though, isn't there, about when we have a beautiful experience like that we attribute it again to something outside of us we attribute it to being in nature or or doing a certain thing like swimming or walking in the woods or whatever it is and if we're not careful we can turn that into something that we do in order to get that nice feeling but really what the principles points us towards is that that feeling is there in us all the time and it's when we drop out of the the other thinking, the personal thinking, that we get to experience that. It isn't to do with something outside of us. You know, I remember many times I've I've had a wonderful experience. It might be in the sea or or something like that. And the temptation is to go and do that thing again to get that nice feeling. <laughs> but but it's never that. And uh, it's incredible the sort of situations in which when you start to appreciate the value of a, of a quiet mind, what you can, the, the, the circumstances in which you can have that, that feeling of, uh, of clarity and connection and, and love and beauty. E even, um, <laughs> I don't know why this one's coming into my mind, but I had one experience where I, um, I, I was sitting on a bus and, and a huge horsefly flew into to where, where I was sitting. And it was one of these really ugly, buggly things and it had a big stinger on the end of it. And normally I'd have been completely freaked out and, you know, batted it away or at least tried to, you know, create some space between me and it. And yet in that moment, I was completely present and quiet and I just fell in love with this fly. <laughs> And it was perfectly fine for me to be, for it to be in my space. There was space for both of us, and it was it was fine. So, you know, there there's no there's no limit to the potential for 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 us feeling um, that love for anything in creation. So, so see. Yes. Um, hello. Hi. Um, uh, this is a strange one to bring up, really, but it keeps on coming up, so I thought I should just say it. Um, I was just, I was just remembering uh, when I was with my father actually in in hospital, and he was the last few weeks of uh, of um, bowel cancer, and uh, it was the last few days, really, when heavily heavily doped up on morphine and, and, and everything that they can find really. And 
they got the dosage slightly wrong and and he sort of came around and th there was a lot of pain and he was screaming and there was drama and it, he couldn't really express but anyway it was it was it was full on mm -hmm. and there was just a moment when i just felt such ex extreme love for him that went through everything I just saw him so clearly for, for who he was. I just saw that pure essence inside him still beneath all the drama and all the suppression and everything. And, and he was yelling and he was yelling at me to get something for him. And, you know, and I just sat there in that complete stillness and, and was just looking at him. I know with sort of such love, you know, and, and he's looking at me like it's such pain. And, and there was just a moment where his eyes softened and he just saw me for a second you know he just he just saw me and there was just and the world sort of stopped and there was just that deep connection of just pure love and the, and, and everything else fell away you know and I know and for that split second he wasn't in any pain you know you know it just stopped I could see that there was just such light in him and there was that beauty and and it was okay. Everything was okay. Yeah. And then he disappeared again. And, and, and a few days later, he, he was gone. You know, he was lost to the painkillers and everything. But I always remember that, you know, there was just that moment of deep, deep, deep connection and, and, and nothing else mattered. And that's, that's what's eternal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, Susie. It's really beautiful what you're describing there seeing the eternal yeah. yeah and i love the way you described how it was everything got quiet for you and that allowed you to see it in him and then just for that moment he also joined you in that stillness yeah yeah that's a really beautiful example of of, of what this understanding points us towards, this eternal nature, where everything is always okay. Yeah, it's always there. Yeah, always there. Thank you. Well. So feel free to unmute yourself or ask a question, share something. If you don't want to ask it yourself, you can always write it on the comments and um, we'll, we'll ask that for you or we'll share that for you. Um, One of the things I remember so vividly and um, with such intensity was um, when you when you do um, one of, one of the courses and you you start learning about the the principles. In our case, it was the inside spice and and it was with Carol and and Ian. And I remember. <laughs> As we were sharing before, you know, it's like, well, I, I came to listen to Ian, but then um, Ian will say something that will maybe turn my world upside down so much that I started feeling that I didn't like him anymore. And then um, Carol will say something that was that I felt like she was in a way more caring or having a more um, easy delivery. And then I will completely fall in love with Carol. And then Carol will say something that would say, well, but I invited Carolina to look at that. And, you know, I may have said something, for example, of, uh, you know, I could have said, said something like, but when I'm in nature, I feel so 
you know, she will have said mm. something on the sort of, uh, yeah, but it comes from you and stop me in my tracks of thinking that it would come from anywhere else. And then instantly I'll go either, oh, oh my gosh, or again, I wouldn't like Carol for what she said, you mm. see? So, um, so intensively during that course, I have these, oh my God, I love them. Oh my God, oh no, 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 I don't like them anymore. Oh, I absolutely hate what they're saying and the way they're saying it. So during, during just the morning, I could have had several different feelings. And I think we, we, we sort of talk about this. And yeah. Yeah. Like, um, where if I have believed that uh, my thinking in the moment was telling me something about them, really, um, I, probably I wouldn't have finished the course and I wouldn't be here. And, um, but it was incredible to see with what intensity it, it sort of changed. And then inevitably, it will go back into love yeah. and connection. Yeah. I think there was one time um, on the Insight Space, there was one weekend that I was talking about the relationship that I got with my mum. And I remember, for me, I was getting a little bit kind of emotional about it. And I think Ian said something and then Carol, you just came back with something. And the only way I can really describe what you came back with was, for me, it just kind of felt like you picked me up and just kind of was like, it's okay. <laughs> and I remember, I can't remember who I was sitting with, but they just, I think there was like a pack of tissues going around. <laughs> and immediately I just got chucked a pack of tissues. I was just like, right, okay. <laughs> But for me, it was it. It was always that. It was that. For you, always had that kind of. There, there was times where you where. Sometimes you just need that kind of. Well, this is the way it is. But then there's the other times where. For, it, it's kind of like good cop, bad cop. <laughs> and then. <laughs> but you did it in such a way that was just, it was what was needed at the time. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think that it, it, it's just one of those things that you can just, it, it's just love. Yeah. And that, and that um, what you're describing there is like a microcosm of our whole life, isn't it? Mm. How we just, this fluctuation of thought, just give us, gives us this multi-sensory experience that's constantly changing. We feel love and connection, we feel out of connection and out of love. And, and all of it's changing all the time and it's all possible. And the beauty of this is understanding is that when we really see that, when we really see that, it doesn't really matter as much at all what's happening out there because we know where that where that love is really coming from it's with within each of us it it's it's beyond the outer form it's those formless principles that sydney banks describes pure love and, and it's, it's, it's not a mistake that we have these fluctuations of thought, that we develop these patterns of thought. It all has the same source. It's all working towards helping us uncover who we really are. To know love, we must know its nemesis. In the world of duality, there will always be 
opposites. What spiritual teachings point us towards is transcending that. Seeing more and more clearly that there is no separation, that there is just one love and we are all it. And love and life will bring us, universal mind will bring us the people to show us that and its opposite. but it's all moving towards an evolution in consciousness and an, and an uncovering of that one love. Oneness and love is at the heart of every spiritual teaching. It's all pointing in the same direction. That's why many spiritual teachers are pointing towards an evolution of consciousness as being the key to changing what we see in the world of form, what's currently happening to humanity. And people like you guys are being part of that evolution of consciousness by sharing um, in the way that you do by creating series like this and um, sharing your love with people around you so thank you thank you I think Maggie wanted to say something else Maggie you can I think you can unmute yourself if not um, yeah. Sorry, I think. Come on, yeah it's just um the sort of the experience in the sea of just sort of utter bliss, kind of just, um, you know, the two of us sort of just in such a, I mean, it was, did feel like a bit of a, a bubble of how can this, you know, in a sense, how can this be so wonderful that, you know, the water supposedly cold and, and yet, you know, we were just so comfortable in that spot of pure bliss. 12 hours later, and I'm in hell again, <laughs> because I can't sleep. And I, you know, my sleep has been just really erratic for a lot of years. And it was just, you know, such a contrast that it's at two, three o'clock in the morning, you know, waiting for it to get to sort of four or five, thinking, well, I probably will go to sleep around four or five. But it was, it was extraordinary in a sense that, you know, looking back now, I can see, well, you know, well, what was your day like yesterday then? Well, it was absolutely fabulous, thanks. You know, it, it was just beautiful and yet within a short space of a few hours you know I'm I'm not in that you know that is just the bitter watches of the night and uh you know love is about seemingly about as far away as it could possibly be that's it and and I think that's a very common experience for us that we have these moments of bliss and then the personal thinking mind kicks in again and obscures that. But there's something hopeful in knowing that we're only ever one thought away from that place of bliss because it's literally who we are. Yeah. We haven't really got to go anywhere to look for it. And for me, the, the deeper I've gone into this understanding and the more I've understood the role of thought and come to value the quiet mind, there's a natural learning that takes place. It's not something I do. It's not something that we can do. But the understanding that that place within us exists naturally we don't take ourselves away from it as often. Or we can navigate our way back to it with more ease. We put less in the way. I love um, Dick and Bettinger's metaphor for this. 
He says, when you realise that the headache you have is being caused by the great hammer you ha you're hitting yourself with, you don't need to learn a technique or read a manual to learn how to drop the hammer. It, it's a natural, organic learning that takes place. When we really understand, when we really see the role of our personal thought system. And, and there's something about the understanding of that that naturally over time settles us down. So we get to recognize our true nature more frequently. And, and even when we're lost in thought, even at 3 a.m. in the morning, there's still a remembrance there that actually, no, we are okay. Because love and peace and clarity and connection is literally who I am. The very essence. I love that word essence. It's the essence of who we are as human beings. And we can't lose it. We just temporarily lose sight of it. Unfortunately, quite often at 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, we'll see. Go, go. <laughs> no, to put my hand up or do it on the. Um, yeah, can, can I just uh, ask a question? Um, a bit of help actually with one of my clients. Just, um, so I'm I'm a homeopath. Mm. I came to see you, you, you a few years ago, Carol. I remember to study Nar Narayani remedies. Yes, I remember. And I remember we spoke about three principles then because I just spent an evening with Ian and I was like, right. and I remember just like chasing into the kitchen and asking and asking. <laughs> um, but anyway, this, so this is a homeopathic client, homeopathy client, and um, and she's she, she was very, she was badly sexually abused as, as a young child and, and all the way through and, and much of which she'd forgotten and so with homeopathy it, it's coming up it's surfacing and she's remembering more and more and and I always remember you then actually saying you never mixed the two homeopathy and three principles I don't know if that's changed or not but anyway I, I've always had that in the back of my mind so but it can't help creeping in nevertheless you know it can't can't help it and and she keeps on asking about this and, and we talk about how now Obviously, it's, it's, it's just a memory, you know, and it's just thoughts. Um, and how at the time she experienced it through thought. And she's she's very comfortable with that. And, and she's learning to be comfortable with whatever feelings come up because they can't hurt her and all of that. But at the same time, at the time, she always, she obviously jumped out of her body like, we all often do when you're in a state of shock, you know, it's a natural reaction. And so she doesn't really want to see it as just thought in a way, because she feels that's disassociating with it in the same way. Do you see what I, I just, I mean, I've been talking and I can see that there can be a slight dichotomy or whatever the word is there, you know, because it's not about disassociation, is it? It's about, I, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I do know what you're saying. And t two things um, are coming to my mind. Firstly, is for you to be clear in yes. yourself yeah. what it is you're doing. What, what, are, what are you up to when you're with her? Are you um, following the homeopathic process? Or are you trying to teach her something about the principles? So first of all, it, it's what I have found helpful, and this is just my personal thing, is to just be very clear about what I'm doing. That doesn't mean to say that you necessarily, you can do it in the same session, but you just be clear yourself what you're up to. Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and then the other thing is about going back to really listening to what's going on and really listening 
to her vital force and trusting that. Because very often we can get the idea that, oh, it would be really helpful for her to see that the memories that are coming back for her and the feelings she's having are just thought. But actually, what her vital force might be doing, what universal mind, that's the, in the language of the principle, what universal mind might be bringing back these memories and these feelings for her to have an embodied experience of them and learn through that. Yeah, it's exactly that. That's yeah. exactly what's happening. Yeah, so, so, so you know, maybe it's just trusting that and letting go of the idea that, oh, yeah, because we, we hear other people talk about, um, you know, I have my own example of this. It was incredibly helpful for me when I saw that the traumatic flashback that I was having was my thinking, that I was re-traumatising myself in this moment with stuff that just didn't exist anymore. The past just didn't exist. And mm. why would I carry on doing that? It's that natural learning that takes place. Mm. And so we hear these stories and we can get an idea that, oh, that's what this person needs to hear. Mm. Yeah. But it might not be that. Yeah, yeah, because her whole, the theme of her whole case is for her learning how to feel again. There you go, there you go. So, so you know, often the, these memories and things will come back when we're ready to deal with them. Mm. And when we can, we can trust life, we can trust the vital force, we can trust universal mind to bring what we need to happen. Yeah, yeah. So it's about helping her be comfortable in the moment with whatever's coming up and knowing at some stage it's a little parcel. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. Because <laughs> it, it can so quickly get a bit cerebral, can't it? That's right. And I think that's why it's helpful for us to check in and see if we're kind of up against something with a client. It's helpful for us to check in and think, well, well, what am I up to? Yeah. Am I trying to direct this even subconsciously? Yeah. Am I trying to get this person to see something I've seen or something yeah. that I think will be helpful? And, and that's the time in which to perhaps step back more and allow more space and go back to listening and trust what comes up and, and the form it takes. Yeah. yeah, it's back to holding the space, isn't it? That's ever really. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Thank you. And, and, and seeing the, the health in her, seeing the wisdom in her, in, in her body mind and whatever that chooses to do. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. Anybody else got any questions or anything they'd like to share? And I also see what's saying because um, what Maggie was also sharing. Um, I, I have problems sleeping. I always had um, since I was a child. And <laughs> I thought, well, once I understand this, it will stop. You know, I'll get better. Everything will get better. And seven, eight years in, you know, knowing about the principles. And I gave myself for a long time a really hard time. So, well, that's obviously I'm not that, that good at this <laughs> because um, I'm still having a lot of trouble sleeping. And there's been moments where it's got in the past couple of years, there have been moments that it got particularly worse. And um, and and I have a, a great homeopath as well helping me with Susie. Um, and I took us this experience is this well something something's going wrong. I'm going I'm going backwards. And I like what you're saying, Carol, because um, I now I started only recently to have a different relationship with my not sleeping at night. Mm. And 
I I don't like it and I have and I have a lot of thinking about what I'm supposed to be doing at night but um, then I'm counting the hours of how many I will have if I fall asleep at when and then and that I have to get up early and blah 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 so I can see that building up in you know in my head and how difficult it is for me to get quiet so the world gets quiet and it's like I can hear my thinking a lot more. <laughs> it's like it's not it's like the mice they they just wake up and they're like dugu, 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 dugu. so and I trust that just by seeing how um, I, I can trust life and what you just said, I, I've just seen this. I can trust, I can trust life. And, um, and I can trust that I can, that I would eventually sleep. Um, whatever that time is. And, um, and I can trust that I can go around in my life and and the moments I, I you know I can say to Wayne look please I, I, I don't I don't trust myself driving and he comes and picks me up and um, so uh, Maggie I don't know if this is helpful but um, just just that it's 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 us magical maybe as the time in the water though when we are in there we don't like it you know um when i'm in there and i can't sleep and i feel frustrated and i start having a lot of thinking i start feeling the coldness in the water um and then I start fighting that feeling. Um, I don't trust life in the same way that I trust it when I have the, the beautiful connection. Mm. And that's what, what I heard mm. when you were talking, um, Carol. Yeah. yeah, I love what you're saying there, Carolina, because um, we're all going to get up against something at some point. You know, life, as Sydney Banks says, life is a contact sport. A principle's understanding doesn't save us from stuff happening. But what be has become more and more obvious to me is that it's when we get lost in our thoughts, when difficult stuff happens, that can often be life showing us something even deeper. Small things, big things, everything is a rich source of, of learning for us. If we can um, just remember that we can trust life. So I, I love what you're seeing there. It's beautiful. It's what I said earlier about even our personal thinking has the same source. Yeah. It's literally all universal mind. There are no mistakes. So if there's anything else you would like to ask or share or I don't know if you have 
something that you would like to share or ask for? I think that for me, it's just that what you just said, Carol, was amazing. It was, it's as soon as we kind of just let go and just be, life will just, just flow. And it's okay when it doesn't, it's okay if it doesn't. That's it. It's been really, really beautiful to be with you guys, all of you, everyone on the call, and uh, particularly you, Carolina and Wayne. Uh, thank you so much for creating this experience and creating this space. It's very special. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much for being here. Um, we were absolutely open to have you we were. in the series, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been absolutely beautiful. Um, I got the missing link here, and it's, I've been having this feeling of just opening the missing link. So if you don't mind, I'll read what, what where a, a card is in it. Um, so this is page 102 of the missing link from Sydney Banks. And it says, we must read ourselves of yesterday's negative thoughts to receive today's new and positive feelings. I do not ask anyone to ignore the past experiences. This would be denial, and denial is not a healthy state. Instead, seek a clearer understanding of the past. Realize that the negative feelings and emotions from past traumatic experiences are no longer true. They're merely memories, a collection of old, stale thoughts. As surely as rust slowly destroys the strongest steel, hate and negative thoughts erode the soul of humanity. Negative thoughts are like scratches on a window. They stop you from seeing life with clarity. When the negative thoughts cease, the scratches disappear and the window becomes crystal clear. Then the beauty and positive aspects of life can be seen. The past is dead. Forget what is old dead and start life anew. Yeah, beautiful. So thank you so much for being here, all of you. And um, and next week we'll we would like to invite you to um, um, our episode number three with Judy Sechman. Um, Judy, it's uh, another wonderful teacher around the principles, one of these very strong women like Carol. Um, she's been around the principles for like 30 years and uh, she's really amazing. Um, she called herself a, an educator of well-being and resiliency. And uh, he's got a free training at the moment for um, veterans in the United States. She lives in Florida. Uh, she works, uh, she, she volunteers for the, the Women's um, Institute. And, um, and she's really a, a fantastic teacher and mentor. And I think uh, we we all agree on that. So she's going to talk about uh, um, heal your heart, heal yourself, heal yourself, and find your heart. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Carol. Thank especially you. thank you for making the time for us. Thank you. And. Um, 
Thank you very much. If you have anything you want to comment or say, or uh, please send us a message. And Carol, before we go, where can people find you? Okay, so uh, my website's very simple. It's threeprinciples.co.uk and you'll find all my contact details there. So and drop me a line if you've got any questions. We'll, we'll put it underneath the, the video and uh, we'll see you next week. So have a fantastic week. And uh, thank you for being here. You can unmute yourselves and say uh, goodbye. Mm -hmm. and Bye.